Hi, my name is Dr. Warwick Bishop and welcome to my podcast and videocast station. Super excited today to have someone to talk to. And indeed, I have Dr. Rebecca Long, who is an accredited practicing dietitian with a special interest in sports, but also cardiometabolic. And in fact, Rebecca is also co-founder of Heartful Flavors, which I'll let her tell us more about later on. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Warwick. How are you? Thanks for having me today. Uh, delighted to have you, and I'm well, thank you. So, look, let's wind back the clock a little. And, well, we all have a, a journey or a story. How did you end up in dietetics? <laughs> Thanks for the question. Well, basically, um, I love food all throughout my life, and um, because of the love of food, I started studying a Bachelor of Food Science at the University of New South Wales. Um, and at that time, I actually worked as a medical receptionist um, as a university student. And that's where I saw firsthand the importance of taking care of our bodies. So combining food and health naturally, it was just master. I, I did the, um, it was just nutrition. And then, and then I did a master in nutrition and dietetics at the University of Sydney. Um, and following from that, immediately, I saw patients one-on-one uh, -on -one in pra practice. I also worked in various areas of dietetics, including like community health programs, um, supermarket nutrition, research, um, also outpatient hospital. And then all along, I kept seeing the same issues that pop up, like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, high blood sugars, um, abdominal adiposity. Like, why do they keep coming together? <laughs> so then that led me to pursue a doctor philosophy of um, diet and cardiometabolic health at the University of Sydney. Um, so to this day, I still see clients one-on-one -on -one and I also recently founded um, Heartful Flavours, uh, for flavours that put your health first, which we'll talk a bit more about later. Yeah. I'll certainly look forward to coming back to Heartful Flavours presently. But uh, you said you love food yourself. Um, just a quick one. Did you have anyone in the family who was medical so that you sort of lent that way or was this somewhat serendipitous? And part two of the question, what are the sort of foods that you really loved that were in the back of your mind as you were thinking about becoming a dietitian and helping others? Good question. Um, thinking about in terms of like uh, what brought me into it, I think it was really my interest in food. Like I just like eating different foods. Um, I found food, food products really fascinating. Um, and when I went to the supermarket, it was like my library. <laughs> That's how I felt. Um, and in terms of having a medical background, like I didn't think about it too much in terms of family history and things like that. But I do like in my family, like people have had diabetes, they've had heart disease, they've had high blood pressure, whether it's the genetic or lifestyle, you know, it, it probably could be more of a lifestyle thing um, in that sense, because it's not like there's no familial hypercholesterolemia from what I can see. It's not like where LDL cholesterol is above six, like not not like that. Um, and I'm fine, so which is good. <laughs> um, but yeah, people in the family have been affected by it, but it does affect lots of people anyway. Yeah. Like when I looked yeah. at the statistics, like two in three have abnormal blood lipids in Australia, which is ridiculous, but that's what is happening at the moment, yeah. Yeah, no question. It is, um, look, one in four people die from heart disease, mm. in fact. And so... Um, this is a non-trivial situation and really anything to the good could make enormous differences and inroads, not just for individuals, but communities, if we can adopt sensible eating patterns. I'm really in awe of you undertaking a PhD. For those who don't know, PhD means that Rebecca is a, a true doctorate. So congratulations, because the study, the journey to do that is significant. They do not award PhDs for... Um, for, for a trivial effort, it's normally a, a major effort of research. So congratulations for doing that. But I'm super interested that your PhD was in cardiometabolic health. Mm. And of course, I'm in exactly the same um, wheelhouse as you in that regard, because I see exactly the same people you described. Mm -hmm. I see people with cardiovascular disease who have uh, di dyslipidemia, abnormal cholesterol levels. They have that central adiposity or weight around their tummy, their triglycerides are up, their sugars may be elevated, they may be diabetic or pre-diabetic. So tell me uh, if there was 
two or three main points that came from your PhD and your understanding about cardiometabolic mm. health, what would they be, Rebecca? Yeah, um, I think that comes, I think, before we discuss it and so people know, they can really define what they are. <laughs> so firstly, with cardiometabolic health, I think it was a term that um, was first coined in 1999. Um, just those risk factors that you just mentioned, like blood sugars, adult, adult adiposity, um, blood pressure, all of that, um, those risk factors that are predictive of car uh, cardiometabolic um, disease, which includes like heart disease and diabetes. So that's how that term was uh, coined. Um, and then in terms of my uh, research, I also looked at diet. But in terms of diet, like you can always analyze single nutrients or whether you analyze a whole diet overall. And that's more and more where the research is going, where we analyze the whole entire diet. So a dietary pattern is actually defined by like the frequency um, uh, proportion of, of, you know, foods in that diet and a combination of all those foods and nutrients and the synergistic effects within that and how that impacts on our, uh, any effects that they have and the impacts on our health risks. Um, so on top of that, in my PhD, I actually looked at frailty as well. So there's another outcome and that's to do with healthy aging. Like I remember reading this paper and it was one of the, um, um, actually another uh, investigators in the study that I was doing and he was part of this paper as well and he's really renowned in the, the space of um, you know frailty um, and older adults um, he's professor uh, David Le Couture and one of the papers kind of talked about aging and like different conditions and when you age like aging of single um conditions is like say one condition so um a chronic condition aging of multiple organs and tissues then you've got multiple morbidity and then as you progress along the age you know as you age and then you got uh, aging of like mo multiple of almost all conditions i'm uh, sorry all um, organs um is where you develop frailty so it's just like a line like that which i found really interesting Look, um, it's a fascinating space. We'll touch on frailty briefly, but yeah. before we yeah. do, cardiometabolic, for those who are listening, really pertains to the heart, as you said. Mm. And when we talk about metabolic, we're mm. mostly talking about diabetes and pre-diabetes, and mm. we talk about the consequences of that. Yeah. Rebecca, when you find someone with pre-diabetes, I know my general recommendation is for those individuals to reduce their carbohydrate consumption. And my belief behind that is if you reduce the carbohydrates, then you reduce the insulin response that those people have. And many of those people are insulin resistant, meaning that when they consume sugar, they have a fairly brisk insulin response. And my understanding and belief is that insulin probably underpins some of the negative outcomes we see in metabolic syndrome, which are uh, increase in adiposity, which we use adiposity instead of fat. Mm -hmm. For those wondering what adiposity means, and central adiposity just means a fat tummy. Uh, we also think that uh, insulin, I believe, probably drives inflammation as well and is certainly linked to triglycerides, which of their own um, are often seen in conjunction with low HDL. So there's this total body picture, including the high blood pressure that you mentioned. So I often aim towards getting those um, blood sugars down by reducing carbohydrate uh, consumption. What's your first step in that sort of arena? Yeah. So particularly, yes, if they have high blood sugar levels, like a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll look at their diet um, and see, you know, how, how their carbohydrate distribution is. So typically when you, when you see a dietitian, if that is that, it will be carbohydrate control. So not necessarily cutting out everything with carbohydrates. That's not the point. It's, um, it's, it, it's more about knowing the portions and how much to have. Like, for example, um, like breakfast, lunch and dinners, um, you could be aiming, say, between 30 to 45 grams of carbohydrate just to split it up and maybe maximum 60 grams. Mm -hmm. Um, and then mid meals, you might do zero to say, oh, 50, zero to 30 grams, depending on what you consume as a snack, whether there is carbohydrate there. So it might be zero, it might be something. Um, Can I just jump in there, Rebecca? Were yeah, you saying um, 30 or 40 grams per um, meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or 30 or 40 grams per day broken up into those three? Because there's, yeah. there's a difference there. I just missed that. 
No, that's okay. Um, actually, at each one, like I would at say that's one. maximal. Like yeah. usually, even if I've seen people with that and they uh, say they have high blood sugars and then they do that, they follow the recommendation. When they, you know, they do their blood test a few months later, there will be improvements. Yeah. Um, and you can also test like whether the carbohydrate you had enough is is excessive, but because. Um, you know, they, they have guidelines where, for example, two hours um, from once you start consuming meal from two hours, you can test it and see what your blood sugar levels are at. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. And mm. uh, what I would really like to do is we've, we've probably done 10 or 15 minutes even without trying. So <laughs> what, what I'd like to do is tease out a little bit more on this cardiometabolic mm. uh, dietary discussion talk a bit yeah. about cutting those carbs a little more and then if you're open to it perhaps bring you back for a second interview to talk about that frailty diet and to talk about heartful flavors how does that sound yeah yeah we'll, we'll see right. what can fit in <laughs> all right let, let's let's come back to the reduced carbohydrate uh, eating regime when you're talking to your uh, clients or mm-hmm. patients um are you making a, a significant distinction between types of carbohydrate? Are all carbohydrates basically the same? And from my understanding, uh, even if you've got brown, grainy bread, the body still breaks it down to simple sugars to absorb it. You may have increased fiber, it may take longer to digest, but it mm. still breaks down to sugar mm. versus a tablespoon of uh, table sugar. So they still break down to the same things. Do you make, how do you make those distinctions for your patients and, and how does that fit in with your discussion? Yeah. So firstly, we, you can talk about the amounts of it and then you can also go to the types of carbohydrate or you can go into like the low glycemic index and the high glycemic index, which is kind of what you c- kind of touched on, like where you have a, a high glycemic index, basically, for example, if you have white rice, like you'll increase the peak of your blood sugar levels faster and it will drop down faster. And that means the energy lasts you for long, uh, for shorter. But what you want is probably like, say, uh, like uh, a low GI rice, um, like basmati rice and, and basmati brown rice. Um, it can increase the blood sugar slower. So the peak is lower and also it lasts longer. So the energy lasts you longer. Another just, example. I'll jump is in there like, briefly. Just for those listening, glycemic index, just as Rebecca alluded, to is a way we measure how quickly that particular food raises the blood sugar level in an individual. And exactly as Rebecca said, the high glycemic index foods are the ones that really pump up the sugar levels very quickly. And the low glycemic foods are the ones that release their sugar very slowly. They're far more complicated carbohydrates. And some of those more complicated carbohydrates releasing that sugar slower may well have less impact on insulin, perhaps. That's some of the thinking behind it, Rebecca. Yeah, and I guess with I guess with whole grains as well, like that's where it comes in where we term it whole grains versus refined grains. And if you look at dietary patterns overall, most of them would always be recommending whole grains. <laughs> None of them would be going for refined grains. And in addition to what you're saying, of course, obviously, if it's just the sugar itself, like which is mostly what you can find in the processed foods and snacks, like obviously those will be high glycemic index and affecting you in that way. Uh, but we do try to look at the foods overall and obviously in a healthy dietary pattern, we always limit the discretionary food, which is like high in fat, salt and sugar, um, those kind of processed foods. Yeah. Well, I think those other foods in particular, the protein, um, the fats, we're going to, I'm going to wrap up here and we'll come Mm. back and we'll talk about those proteins and fats because they tie into frailty. And um, I think we're pretty well on the same page when we see cardiometabolic patients. We want them to reduce their Mm. carbohydrate consumption overall. We want to reduce that insulin exposure. But um, how about we wrap it up here and I invite you back for another occasion where we talk about the protein and the fat, particularly for that frailty and for the heart. Is that okay with you? And yeah, well, yeah, definitely like with healthy dietary patterns overall, not just um, reducing carbohydrate consumption. It's just if it, if, it is, if it is excessive, then it's a point that we can make. But it's more about focus on the food groups that we have. And we can definitely talk about that more in the next um, session we have coming up. Thank All you. All right. So That's, that sounds great. Is there anything else you want to add about cardiometabolic uh, dietary advice or any of your one or two of your special <laughs> hints or tips that you uh, would really just like to share before we wrap up? Um, I, I definitely can, and I hope it doesn't take too long, but I think the listeners will will, will love this. Um, Please. 
So basically, like in dietary patterns overall, like the most best diets for um, like heart health, metabolic health, from what we can see and know from all the different studies, um, you'll have the Mediterranean diet, you'll have the DASH diet, you have the portfolio diet, you also have uh, like for example the nordic diet where there's more research there increasing research um the dash diet sorry stands for the dietary approaches to stop hypertension all of these diets would always have vegetables fruits uh whole grains um legumes nuts and seeds that's in all of them okay um and then most of them uh, also all of them will always limit the discretionary food like the high fat salt and sugar processed foods um, there's minimal red meat and most of them also recommend the fatty fish and all of that together would make sure if you're eating that naturally your diet will be low in saturated fat low in sodium uh, low in glycemic index and also high in potassium so those are all the nutrient characteristics of that yeah a real call out to uh, whole foods nutritious foods and uh, steering away from particularly uh, excess animal product and saturated fat. So very sensible advice there. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Rebecca, I'm going to wrap it up there. I'd really like to thank you for sharing today. Thanks, Laurie. Thanks for having me. Uh, for those listening, I'm sure you've got as much out of this as me. Absolute delight to speak with Dr. Rebecca Lung. Uh, thank you again for joining me. I look forward to the chance to speak again. For anyone listening, if you've got any queries or questions, please drop me a note at Dr. Warwick, oh no, at info um, at drwarwickbishop.online and uh, open to any questions or suggestions for future podcasts. I'd be super grateful if you enjoy these podcasts, if you share them with someone else as well. For now, though, I am going to wish you the very best and I hope you live as well as possible for as long as possible. Take care and bye for now. Thank you.